All right, all right. So nice to see you lovely people. I'm just going to um, do some pinning of people because there are three of us tonight. So I think it'll be easiest this way to see us all. Just need to find the good rabbi. Which good rabbi? Ah. <laughs> a good question. I see at least three good rabbis. <laughs> Um, so hi everyone. We're gonna we're gonna get started right off the bat. Um, really lovely to see you all here, and especially lovely to be here with Angela and with Rabbi Chaim Wiener. We're gonna explore a little bit tonight about the question of conversion, and especially about I called this um, conversion journeys behind the curtain, because I think that probably most of us know a conversion journey like we know someone you know maybe we went through one maybe we maybe a partner or a friend or a family member has um you know gone through a conversion journey and there's a lot that actually happens behind the scenes and I thought it would be nice for us to spend a little bit of time tonight exploring what that means um so we have with us you know, we are three people in front of us right now who spend a lot of our time and effort and thought on the question of conversion. Um, and actually, we're we're kind of a team. Uh, we spend we spend time together in different ways, but ultimately, uh, we are we are a team uh, dealing with this. And um, Angela, as you know, if you are a member of New London, I am sure that you know very well already and requires no introduction. Nonetheless, I am going to introduce her and you will uh, forgive me for that. And um, Angela Gluck leads our L'Chaim conversion class. And um, I'll talk a little bit about what that means. And she'll talk a little bit about what that means in a <clears> moment. But Angela is the, the face that people are used to in terms of going through that journey and has been for 16, 15 years, 15 years, 15 years. <clears throat> Sorry, I added one for you there, Angela. Um, and Rabbi Chaim Wiener is the Av Beit Din, um, also known to many of us both from his position as being a Beit Dean and because he spent some time serving as a rabbi at New London too. Um, being the Av Beit Dean means that he is the director of the Beit Dean, the head of the Beit Dean. Um, the Beit Dean is the rabbinic court which oversees certain areas of Jewish law and I think probably most heavily oversees the question of conversion um, in England and actually for the entirety of the Masorti movement in Europe. Before we get started, I want to let you know a few things. The first is that um, I think there will be some good questions from the audience tonight. Anything you want to know about what happens on this side of the table, so to speak. Um, if you want to throw those questions in the chat, you are very welcome to. If you are a little bit shy and want to be able to share those questions anonymously, I'm throwing a link into the chat now which will take you to somewhere that you can anonymously ask questions. Um, the only thing I ask from you tonight when it comes to those questions, because I'm taking them from two places, the chat, publicly or privately, however you want to do it, and this link is that you keep your questions as concise as you can, and that will help me to be able to, uh, to field them. I want to start before I turn to Angela and to Rabbi Chaim by explaining something that, um, that I tend to say to people who are coming into the conversion journey. Um, I get to be the person who has the, who oversees the process. I don't do what Angela does. I'm not in the classroom every week with them, um, but I get to have the sort of incoming conversations, conversations along the way that are sort of broader. And finally that before the bait Dean um, interview really with them. Um, and one thing that I like to talk about when people come in, is I like to split us into two groups of three for what the conversion journey is and what's necessary on it. I'm going to speak about the second one first. The second group of three are the three halachic parts that we need to deal with in order to take you from being in a non-Jewish status to being in a Jewish status. 
those three parts of maybe Rabbi Chaim will talk to them more in a little bit, um, but they are Mila um, for, for men, um, which is circumcision, um, Kabbalat Ol Mitzvot, which is a statement of taking, of receiving the, the Torah and the mitzvot upon oneself, and um, mikveh, which is the ritual uh, body of water. Those are the three, and for women, two pieces of halakha, like ritual pieces that are required to take you from being a non-Jew to being a Jew. But as I expect is obvious, um, that is not all there is to a conversion journey. That is the end of, the, of, that, of that part of the conversion journey and the beginning of the Jewish life. There's a whole piece that happens that, um, that Angela spends a lot of time on, which is taking people from where they are at the beginning when they first turn up to being ready for those pieces that they go through with Rabbi Chaim. And the three pieces that we tend to talk about when it comes to that is knowing, doing, and feeling. Um, knowing is the, the stuff that uh, Angela spends a lot of time on in class. Doing is Jewish observance. And feeling is getting to the point where one feels ready to be a Jew at the end of that process. Um, those are you know, two sets of three that each of the people who are here with me today get to spend a lot of time thinking about and dealing with as we as we walk along this uh, weird and wonderful road. Um, I want to I want to start now by um, by turning to um, uh, by turning to each of my guests, friends, colleagues, and just starting with the question, actually, of like, how did this come to be? Like, how did you get to be involved in this particular part of a, of a conversion journey? Um, let's do this in sort of the chronological order of walking through the conversion. So we'll start with, we'll start with Angela. Thank you, Rabbi Natasha, for that introduction, and um, to Rabbi Haim Wiener for, for joining this too. It's a great, really a great privilege. So, um, <clears throat> uh, as a member of uh, New London, um, I, I was invited to to head up this this program. It was very, very, very small. Um, previously, there had been very few people in, interested in becoming uh, becoming Jewish who, who, weren't, who weren't Jewish. Um, and, but there was a sort of a, a gathering storm of, uh, of four people. And uh, when <clears throat> previously there had been some ad hoc or informal arrangements, but it looked as if there was going to be something, uh, a, a kind of critical mass. And so it was decided to have, um, a teaching a teaching program and i was i was asked to 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 to, to do that uh it was in the time when rabbi reuven hammer was uh, our, our rabbi um uh, interim i think he was called an interim rabbi and uh he was not going to be with us very long and so he didn't want to have a great deal of uh, investment of time and emotion in it and so i was i was simply asked to do uh uh, a, a, a program and it was very very simple at the beginning um, and the, so that was early 2006 uh, and it was also felt at the time that there might be members of the congregation who would be interested in what you might roughly call an introduction to Judaism who'd missed out on Jewish learning at some point in their life so it was open to uh, open to 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 anyone who wanted to to come um, I don't know if you want me to talk now about how it how it changed, but that was initially how it began with with four people who were e expressing an interest in be, be in becoming in becoming Jewish, and so I devised um, a, a skeleton of a program which is now much fuller and deeper, and I like to think richer. But that's that's what happened yeah, early you. in two thousand and, and, and six. In that um, let's just hold that piece. Yep. I think we'll come back to it in just a moment. And um, Rabbi Chaim, thank you so much for joining joining us. Um, I, I think a, quite a complicated piece around the uh, um, how the Beit Dean came to be and how you became to uh, you came to be involved um, in conversion work. Could you talk us through that? You'll need to unmute yourself first. So, so first of all, thank you for having me here. And uh, I see familiar faces. Always nice to be uh, uh, with my friends at New London. So I would say that I've been doing this work for about 30 years 
And I first came to Britain in 91 and I became the rabbi at uh, Edgeware Masoti Synagogue, which was my first real pulpit. And at that time, Rabbi Jacobs was in the pulpit at New London and the, the nature of his stature and he was very well known and he would get requests all the time around conversion, not necessarily from New London Synagogue, but from beyond New London Synagogue. And to be honest, at that point in his career, he wasn't that interested in uh, dealing with those. It was kind of not the focus. And uh, he asked me to, to take some of those cases. So, so basically the way it worked at the beginning is that when people would turn to him, he would refer them to me and I would follow up uh, uh, with them. And if the cases were more interesting or more difficult, I would sit with him and we would discuss those cases and discuss the halachic options for how to deal with them. And uh, my first work in conversion was really almost uh, mentorship uh, uh, with Rabbi Jacobs uh, uh, dealing with uh, those cases. At that point, the conversion and the movement was done on a more ad hoc manner. Uh, when there was enough interest then in, a, in an ad hoc, ad hoc way, uh, Rabbi Wittenberg, Rabbi Jacobs and myself would convene together for uh, a, a, a Beit Din. At the same time that I came to London, a friend of mine with whom I studied in Israel, Rabbi Rivon Krigier, uh, went to Paris and he became the rabbi of, at the time, the only Masoti community in uh, France and Paris. And they had no ability to put a Beit Din together in Paris because he was alone. And because of our friendship, we started to bring the French candidates here to London. And that gave a European element to uh, uh, the Beit Din. And eventually, uh, the work grew and the Beit Din grew and uh, uh, it became too much to deal with in the kind of ad hoc way that uh, we had been doing it in the 90s. And the Beit Din became a formal institution as a separate European Masoti Beit Din in 2005. And that's the point that I became the director of the Beit Din and it kind of uh, moved from there. Okay. Yofi, thank you. Um, I want to now ask both of you the same question, which I suspect will probably uh, be quite different because of the places in which you sit on this journey, um, which is how things have changed. Like when you were first sitting down and trying to figure out how this would all work, and now some significant number of years later, having seen all of these people through this journey, uh, what are the things maybe what are the things that you didn't expect that you've had to account for along the way and the ways in which maybe we're a little uh, a little better at this now than we were at the beginning um let's uh, let's start with angela thank you i'm not i'm not sure i'm any better at it than i was but i'll tell you what happened so so one one of the things that happened quite quite significantly um in that period when rabbi reuven hammer of blessed memory was the rabbi and much more significantly when 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 Rabbi my Jeremy joined us is that the numbers uh, swelled at about the same time uh, or maybe maybe even before J Jeremy arrived I was starting to feel that there was something very specific about this kind of learning that it wasn't Judaism 101 or you know page one of the textbook um, that there was, as, as I like to say, people, people are not coming to get a, you know, to pass an exam, they're coming to change their life. And so, although the learning, the knowledge and the understanding um, are, are, are very important, it's also about, uh, pardon the cliche, a holistic look at the, uh, at the person who is progressing so through this, um, through this along this this this, this path and it's by the way it's never a straight path i yet to meet someone who goes like that it's it's kind of up like that and it's a long and winding road and so uh there, there was there is a real uh a, a, a sense that it it needs to be um a, a, a about about the, the the whole person and uh, alongside that in, pa in parallel to that 
was something I, I asked for and which Jeremy sort of acceded to, which was this, this ought to be a commitment course. This is not for people, you know, it hasn't, as I sometimes say, it, it, it is not, you know, is not a revolving door that people drop in and drop out. It has to be a, a, a course where people can feel, um, can feel uh, safe, can feel secure, um, that they come to see, you know, the same people, pretty much the same people all the time. They can uh, share thoughts, experiences, ideas in a trusted uh, and trusting um, in environment. And for that, it is, as it were, most of the time, it is closed to other to to other people. So that's a, a very a, a very big difference. I think another thing is also that uh, the numbers swelled quite quite substantially from the from the initial four, and so it's become more complex. I, I don't mean more burdensome uh, burdensome. I don't at all mean that, but it has become more complex because of uh, various uh, personalities. Something else that has happened. Um, is that I think it was originally thought of as a sort of couples thing. You know, it, it, typically it would be a woman who wants to marry a Jewish man, or maybe she's already civilly married to him, and and she needs she wants to convert because of the uh, because of the children. And increasingly we find, <clears throat> excuse me, that there are sing, single people um, who uh, some of whom have some Jewish ancestry, but not necessarily. Um, and we found that there are male converts alone. Um, that we've had uh, we've had female alone, male alone, um, heterosexual and homosexual, and some in partnerships. Um, we've had married couples coming already, both converting. So there's been a much more varied um, um, clientele, if I can if I can put it that way. That's really a very very big difference. Um, thank you for that, Angela. And I'm uh, immediately uh, seeing a question that's come in asking why uh, why do you think that it's the why do you think it's become so much more popular? Um, I actually want to answer this because I don't think that Angela is going to say this, which is that I think a huge part of the reason that our conversion course is popular is because of Angela. Um, and it's precisely because, you know, she's a great educator. I know you're going to make a face. Sorry about this, Angela. She's a great educator and also has this real sense that it's not a Judaism 101 course and people who come for this kind of course don't come because they want a Judaism 101 course. They come because they understand that there's something about identity shifting and a change of life that's happening. Um, I also, you know, I, I kind of want to um, cheat and answer my own question, but I also want to do this partly because I think it's more relevant to the part of the journey that Angela is talking about in terms of learning as we go along. Um, I have not been doing this very long. I have only been a rabbi for a couple of years, and it's been a real pleasure and honor to be dealing with people along this, um, this kind of journey. And one thing that I learned very quickly, actually, and have been continuing to learn is that every person is very different mm. and it can look like you know it might be an 18 month process and it might look like it's a very similar story but when you get down into it everyone has a very different background you know relationship with their own family relationship with a particular piece of jewish history or text or something like that that just means that it really um, requires a lot of uh, a sense of the human being in front of you, not a sense of the statistics of what we're going through. Um, thank you very much for that, Angela. Um, I want to turn now and ask you, uh, Rabbi Chaim, the same question. You're dealing with a, a slightly different end of this, um, but in the last, you know, however many years it's been that you've been working on a bait team dealing with um, conversion. Uh, what are the things that have changed and what are the, the lessons that you've learned about conversion and what it means to do this sacred work? Right, so in, in, in a way, I could say the same that Angela did is that one of the big changes is that it's much bigger. So it, it's bigger both because there are more people converting in the UK, but it's bigger because the Beit Din is much bigger now. So in a typical year, I will be doing Beit Din sessions not only in London, but also in Paris, in Madrid, in Budapest, in Kiev, in Stockholm. So it, it's a very, very 
a, a big enterprise dealing with lots of rabbis and lots of different communities and uh, creating standards and maintaining a program that has real halachic integrity across such a broad range of communities is one of the, the really big uh, challenges. And there's tremendous diversity in the program, which I'm, I'm not sure everyone is aware. I'm aware probably more than anyone, but what it means to be Jewish is different in London than it is in Kiev, uh, right? People relate to their Judaism in a different manner. What it means to, if you have a requirement in the program that people eat kosher food, that is different when you're sitting uh, a, a mile away from a dozen kosher shops, or if you're in a place where you're hundreds of miles away, <coughs> thousands of, uh, a thousand miles away from your, your closest uh, uh, possibility of, of, of getting kosher food. So there's a tremendous amount of diversity. And uh, that's one of the things that we've had to uh, uh, cope with. I would say personally, one of the things that I've learned is just a different perspective and a perspective that comes from time. You know, I was used to, you do a conversion and after the conversion you do a wedding. But uh, I've been in the rabbit at enough time that I do conversions and I've done weddings and I've done uh, the bar mitzvahs of the children from those weddings. And I've even done the weddings of the children uh, uh, from the, the, the places where I've done the, the, the conversions. But part of that perspective, uh, some of that's very nice, but uh, you, you, you don't learn or you, you learn a bit when everything goes well, but you also learn from when things go wrong. And one of the things you learn with perspective is that uh, uh, sometimes you make decisions that play out differently after 10 years and after 20 years. I've had cases where uh, I, you know, I thought it was appropriate to perhaps be more lenient with a conversion because of the person and their commitment and it, it was right for the moment. And, and then that person makes Aliyah to Israel and he spent three years in court battling uh, uh, their right to make Aliyah. And you, 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 you learn that there's a price sometimes to that leniency. And uh, the perspective has taught me that uh, uh, when you think about conversion, you don't think about a year or two years, you're thinking about a generation and two generations. And the, 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 the importance, uh, <clears throat> you know, the integrity of the conversion is the value of that conversion. And that has implications, not only for the people themselves, but for the, the generations that are, uh, are coming. I've learned uh, that conversion is very political and it particularly connected with the politics in Israel, but also the politics within the Jewish world. And I'm battle hardened with those politics, something I never anticipated at the beginning. And uh, the last thing is uh, it's that uh, now I'm involved not only in the issues of conversion for Europe, but uh, I'm part of a small group of people that looks at is issues of conversions in the conservative movement worldwide. And I actually just came off of a meeting, which was uh, the rabbinical assembly looking at <clears throat> all kinds of different things that I never dreamed that we would be thinking about. But the, the issue on the agenda was uh, uh, a, a, a rabbi who's going off and converting whole villages in Nigeria. And what do we do with things like that? And uh, uh, how do you create movement policies around who we should convert and where we should convert? What do you do with rabbis who follow the rules and rabbis who don't follow the rules? And uh, it's become much bigger, much more complicated and uh, uh, much more serious than, than it appeared 30 years ago when I first started working in this area. Um, amazing, thank you so much, Rabbi. <laughs> that was a lot, um, there was a lot in that and several things I wanna take us, uh, take us back to. Um, I think it would be great to start in this um, moment. You, you talked about diversity, both you know, this sort of diversity of the people who come into the program and the, the situations that are before us. Um, and I, I think it's especially um, 
interesting and important to talk about the sort of diversity of people who come into the program who, and I'm going to use a phrase I don't like here, look Jewish, um, and people who, for whatever reason, aren't read that way in, in synagogue. And I think this, you know, this plays out a lot in synagogue life, maybe more so than in sort of the running of a Beit Din. Um, and I just wanted to sort of wave the flag for a conversation about that particular, um, that particular complexity and ask if either of you want to sort of uh, speak to that a little bit. Yeah. Um, Angela, do you want to take that? Yes, yes. I, I, I think I'm, I'm really glad that you've, you've, you've raised that because it's something very much, um, it's very much on, on my mind a lot, of, a lot of the time, and I, I think that that the, uh, the 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 issue of diversity of not looking Jewish, not appearing to be Jewish, because um, because of color racism or because of or blonde blondism, um, is is is. Uh, a problem that is not created by the person who is on this journey and wishes to convert. It is a problem, I think, created by um, the, the, an existing Jewish community or might be created by an existing community, probably most of the time. And, and so therefore they, um, uh, it, it's a bit like the sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge. They actually have to, uh, to, to, to deal with that problem, have to solve it within their life. Um, in a way that can be really quite quite cruel sometimes, um, and I, I I think that it's um, uh, I, I think we first of all have to recognise that worldwide the Jewish people is ethnically very diverse. Um, it, it has pretty much been that way for several, many hundreds of years, if 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 not longer, and um, so the issue about Look, looking Jewish or appearing to be Jewish or standing out, you know, sticking out like a sore thumb, is is something that's quite localized. Um, so, uh, so Chaim Wiener and I, for and others, were a couple of years ago in amongst Ugandan Jews, and we looked weird, right? We just looked weird. <laughs> they were lovely with us and we were lovely with them, but we didn't look Jewish at all. <laughs> Our skin was the wrong color for one, for one thing. So I think we have to recognize this, this whole diverse. And, but one of the real challenges is, is sort of touches on a, a, a halakha, which is that we say, and we mean that w when you become Jewish, you are fully a Jew absolutely fully a Jew. Um, and there's lots and lots of sources on this, including the, the Rambam and, and before him and after him, saying that when you make that, when you make that step, and, and, and the, the mikvah, we may talk about mikvah, is a rebirthing process. So you are, re, you are rebirthing yourself as a Jew, which means that we never, we never remind somebody that they once weren't, not because there was anything shameful in their life before, but because it would imply that we haven't accepted who they are now. And that is very difficult, for example, for converts of color. It is really very, very difficult if they haven't obviously come from Ethiopia or Uganda. So uh, I, I don't have a good answer for that, um, unfortunately, but I, I have a good question. I have good questions about it. Yeah. Um, I do think, you know, I, I just sort of, sort of want to uh, want to mention as someone who's um, I've, I've been on both sides of this journey, which is uh, quite quite interesting for me in that I also converted to Judaism. Um, I'm also a mixed race individual, um, and I don't have particular um, issues with walking into Jewish spaces and having people question my status, which I think is partly because I have the word rabbi before my name, and I think it's also partly because of what people. Um, are expecting when people walk into synagogue what they expect a Jew to look like for whatever reason my uh, my father's surname man and what my you know what my parents gave me genetically fits into that and um, in a way that you know it's um can be a lot a lot more difficult we as a Jewish community make it a lot more difficult for, for some people and um, is there anything that you want to add to that Rabbi Chaim I do think you know Angela spoke to it very um, very beautifully I don't know if you have any other thoughts to add to that I would only add that it plays out a little bit differently at the Beit Din level in that uh, for me, the principle is very simple. And that is that uh, the people who stand before the Beit Din are people 
and I'm not interested in any of the other adjectives that get added to that. So uh, I don't weigh a person's suitability differently if they're male or female or uh, straight or gay or identify in any other kind of way. I actually don't take that into, like, I wouldn't even ask that question. It's, it's, it's also not, it's, it's just not the way that, 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 that I work. And uh, uh, questions of color for, for, for sure, uh, at the level of the Beit Din, since the, the main contact of people is with their communities and with their rabbis, and it's quite far down the process where uh, uh, we actually see the people rather than hear the stories. And for me, it's really important that the, the the baiting people are people and you have to ask the same set of questions and take the same set of considerations into when, when, when you're weighing each individual case and do I think we do a good job with that I think we do uh, I think we do do a good job with that I'm uh, uh, <clears throat> we, we we try very hard and I and and uh, but but I kind of, obviously you don't know the experience of the other side of things. I only know it from, from, from my direction, but from our direction, we try very hard that the, 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 the Beit Din is an open space for everyone. And obviously part of the Beit Din is that we do judging, but the judging we do is about commitment. The judging we do is about learning. The judgment we do is about all kinds of objective criteria. There's certainly no judging we do uh, around questions of color and gender and uh, uh, those kinds of issues. I think it's really, you know, it's a really interesting point, um, Rabbi Chaim, that at sort of um, you know, the the root of the issue is really with Jewish community and yeah. wider community in general, rather than um, mm. when we get to the Beit Din level and the problem, of course, is. Um, the possibility that people aren't coming to the Beit Din level because of experiences that might happen in Jewish community more widely yeah. and which is you know less able to be controlled from that from that higher level and please God we will uh, see healing in in that situation um, I also I think it's worth you know on another of the sort of trickier topics that are harder to talk about and um, I think it's worth talking about the politics of a lot of this um, which is you know, there's sort of a to the right situation and to the left situation. How do we deal with, you know, who we consider to be Jewish, who don't go through our Beit Din, um, you know, reform liberal conversions, conversions that happen in other places that we have less, maybe less knowledge of. And also um, there is the fact that some of our conversion, our conversions will not be considered by people who are far to the right of us within orthodoxy. I think um, I think mostly this is a question really for for you, Rabbi Chaim. Um, you know what? I don't know if you want to talk to those one at a time, but you know what are the criteria that we're looking at, and how how do we handle the fact that there are these situations um, that we you know, we take people through and we tell them that they're Jewish and we believe that they're Jewish and we do have them. Um, we do put them in a situation in which there are places they'll walk into where people won't consider that conversion to be to be valid. Um, Rabbi. Right, well. I haven't, haven't thrown you an easy question. Right. <laughs> well, as, as you say, you look to the right and you look to the, the left and it's a different set of issues. I think that the main thing for me is, is that I can defend everything that we do from a halachic point of view and uh, make sure that what we do has halachic integrity and is difficult to challenge on, on, on the real content. And that, 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 that I think is, is important. There's a lot of politics around uh, uh, conversion. Uh, the, the, the bottom line is that the Orthodox don't, uh, don't recognize any conversion that doesn't take place in the in, in an Orthodox Beit Din. Uh, I personally think that, right, there, there's lots of reasons why they are particularly strict 
in the Orthodox world. I think that they do the Jewish world a disservice, and I think that they do the Orthodox communities a disservice, because conversion is something that strengthens the Jewish people, and conversion is something that strengthens Jewish communities. And uh, whenever there are situations arise that someone wants to convert, if your child meets a non-Jewish partner, the question is, do you open your arms and do you welcome them or do you push them away? And if the answer from in, in the Orthodox world is that for the most part, we're gonna push people away, then we open our arms. And uh, the, <clears throat> the, the politics works against us, but the demography works with us because we're being strengthened by those people coming in. And over time, if every couple of Orthodox, non-Orthodox ends up in the non-Orthodox world, that strengthens the non-Orthodox world. But those are difficult things. I, I, I spend time, I've fought in courts in Israel, I spend time in, 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 in lots of different things, but, but, but ultimately my only answer to that is that you don't really need the Orthodox world for anything. Our role is to have thriving communities in which people can have all of their needs met. Our role is to make sure that there are schools that people can go to, that there are that that every single religious service from being born to being buried can can, can take place in an open, welcoming uh, uh, environment. And with time, uh, I believe that things are going to uh, uh, get better. In the other direction, there are also issues. There are issues, first of all, with, uh, as you say, the question of what we recognize and what we don't recognize. And for here, I would say the criteria for me is, is, is very simple. There, there, there are basic halachic requirements. You listed them already of uh, circumcision and immersion and kabbalat ol mitzvot. And uh, we recognize conversions that met the halachic requirements. And where the conversions didn't meet the halachic requirements, we work with people to make it easier for them to meet the halachic requirements. So. Uh, there, there's lots of personal stories and there's lots of things uh, uh, within it, but uh, the, the bottom line is that we want to have halakhic integrity, but we also, you know, we do that in a way that's welcoming. We, we, don't, say, we, we don't tell someone we're sending you away, you're not Jewish. What, what we'll tell someone if they haven't met those requirements is this is what you need to do in order for you to find a home in one of our communities. That's how we try to work with uh, 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 that uh, question. But we have lots of politics with the reform movement also. I would like to tell you that, that, that it's all smooth and easy, but the the, the, the bottom line, you know, where are your European Masoti Beit Din, but there are maybe half a dozen Orthodox communities that uh, use our Beit Din as their Beit Din because, uh, because we're open and we're reasonable and we do the work that the rabbis think really need to be done. Uh, uh, so behind the scenes, there's all kinds of uh, uh, stuff like that. And frequently we have more political problems with the reform movement than with the Orthodox. That's um, super, super interesting that, that um, it's almost like there's some stuff that's just more clear cut between us and, and Orthodoxy that means it's less tricky in some ways, whereas some of the relationship between, between us and the reform is in a way a little bit stickier. And mm. um, I just want to respond to a, a couple of things that you brought up. First of all, this question of um, this question of uh, does conversion strengthen us? I actually got an anonymous question about like how does the um, how does conversion strengthen us? And I think you were right in terms of sort of the demographics, but I also think there's a really interesting point here about um, you know people that we that go through a conversion are some of the you know the Jews who are waving the flag for our people the most significantly who are well educated who came into this sort of knowing the whys about things not just the hows and I think that's a that's hugely um hugely strengthening too. I'm just remembering actually many, many years ago uh, when I was a member at New London instead of now a, a rabbi at New London, um, there was a, a Pesach that, um, that were, there was a Seder that was happening and one of the caretakers in New London had come out and said, I'm looking for a Lachayim person. 
And I said, what, what do you mean? You're looking for a Lechaim person. He was like, I'm confused about the Seder plate. I just need someone from Lechaim to come and tell me what's supposed to, what's supposed to be on it. And like, you know, that's exactly what we want, which is, um, that's, that's how, one of the ways in which we, in which we get strengthened. Um, uh, Angela, is there anything that you want to add to this question of sort of the politics on, on either side but, of this? Yes. Well, first of all, thank you for that. I didn't know that story. <laughs> that, that, that is, that is wonderful. I mean, what, one of the things I think we, we try to do in the, in the, in the, the kind of the formal education, well, I, I try to do is to, it, it, it's not to turn somebody into a rabbi, Natasha. Um, it's, that was never my goal. That was an accident. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I slipped up there. Um, but but actually, I, I, I think that people need to know enough to make an informed decision. Aleph. But they need to know enough to build on their learning because I make a distinction between being learned and being learning. And I think that what the people, uh, what, I, what I try to engender in this program is a, a, an interest, a love, a, a questioning attitude, a, a challenge, an appreciation of, of diverse viewpoints of what a machloket really looks like, etc. And I think that's part of the, the learning. And that may be why the caretaker thought that they are, they, are, they are not. I think also what's very interesting is that quite a lot of Jewish adults may have been to Haida, for example, or Jewish day school, but their Jewish education very often stopped just when it could have started to get interesting, you know, just when they could have, you know, in, in their teens, say, or young, just when world, the world of ideas could properly uh, uh, open up, it sort of ended. And so what's distinctive about this is a, a group of people who are genuinely interested um, and they've got some emotional investment in, in, in their learning as well. And they're learning as adults. So they're coming to it with the freshness of a baby, you know, because it's new, but also the kind of the wisdom of their adulthood. And it is a, it is a phenomenal combination. I mean, it really is quite, quite extraordinary. It's, a, it's why one of the reasons it's such a, a privilege to, to be part of it. I also just want to say one other little thing, and it was a few minutes ago, but something about this, this, this question of, of diversity and the demographic that, that, that Rabbi uh, Chaim spoke very eloquently about. I think that <clears throat> I would flip it over and say, if we, if we didn't believe that, we would have to say that the Jewish people has got a monopoly on values and a monopoly on virtues. And I think one of the things that uh, I really uh, appreciate in this great privilege of being close to people along on this journey, and sometimes kind of like accompanying them a little bit on, on their journey, is, is, is a recognition of the, um, the beauty of the whole human spirit. And that there are these qualities and these natures and these characteristics as well as these experiences that they are bringing so it isn't just the you know entering the gene pool which is very healthy for us but it's also entering our moral gene pool which i think is really quite 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 phenomenal Yofi, um, thank you. I've just, you know, as we've been talking through this last part, had several questions zoom at me in several different directions, which is clearly because Rabbi Chaim said something that people weren't expecting, um, which is, I, I'm just going to sort of summarize, which is um, issues with the reform. Like, I think that people sort of know that there's a there's a politics question on the on the side of orthodoxy. But um, Rabbi Chaim, could you talk us through what some of the sort of politics questions with people who are to our you know um, on our other on our other shoulder might be? That can come from uh, different directions. Sometimes it's just pure politics. So we're currently dealing with a case in in, in Warsaw in Poland. Uh, where uh, the Orthodox and the Reform have access to the mikvah, but we don't. And the reason is that either the head of the Orthodox community or the head of the non-Orthodox community and the official Jewish establishment has to give you permission to go to the mikvah. And the Reform don't really want there to be a competing synagogue there. So the, the rabbi there is misusing his power to prevent us access to the mikvah, right? That, that kind of, we, 
we, we're used to that with the Orthodox, but we're not used to that uh, uh, with the Reform. But uh, more usual kinds of uh, uh, differences can be in places where there, I, I don't see as being a competition, but, uh, that, but there's a perceived competition between communities and between conversion programs. And, and, and suddenly we're accused, why did you steal our candidates? Uh, uh, and uh, I, I, I can tell you very clearly that we never go out to steal the reform candidates, but sometimes we have some very good programs and sometimes people are attracted to a more traditional uh, uh, setting. The, the very reasons why every single person uh, sitting on my screen in front of me has the choice to go to New London Synagogue or to uh, uh, the, the Liberal Synagogue or, or, or West London Synagogue, and you have all of those choices. And, and, and people in the range of choices are looking for a certain combination of tradition and modernity, and that's uh, uh, um, a certainty. So, so anywhere around people might make that choice, but, but suddenly we get accused, get accused of, of, of stealing candidates or stealing members. Uh, uh, so, so there can be lots of politics in there, which uh, you would think shouldn't be, but, but actually are. So um, just to clarify, because I'm seeing this in a couple of the questions too, you know, uh, we consider a conversion to be a valid conversion if they follow the hacha, so those three pieces that I spoke about beforehand, Rabbi Chaim repeated, and um, if they've gone through those things, you don't need to reconvert. Um, what I've seen a little bit of over recent years, which I think is partly because of shifts that have been happening in the Masorti world, um, is uh, sort of more conversations around queerness um, from people who you know maybe began their journey elsewhere for whatever reason who because our um the, the sort of the Masorti world is looking a little bit differently now want to complete a conversion here or switch from being where they were to to being where we are um and i think you know as as we move along in the world there are certain things like that that will attract people um, and will cause you know, some, some political issues maybe, but also ultimately it's about um, people finding the right home for them. Um, I think that, um, you know, we've been talking about politics and there's a, there's a particular political piece that I think is really worth talking about, which is what's happening in Israel right now. Rabbi Chaim, you spoke about a little bit about sort of finding yourself in situations of, of dealing with um, Israel when it comes to conversions. Could you just talk us through very quickly on, you know, what's, what's going on there? I know that the, the face of conversion in Israel is also changing a little bit. Right, so it's certainly changing, and over the years, it's changing in our favor. So the 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 current uh, law in Israel is that anyone who is converted through a recognized community, now all of these terms are important. Anyone who converts through a recognized community has the right to immigrate to Israel as a Jew, and a recognized community is uh, Orthodox, Conservative, Reform. Uh, but uh, you know, the, 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 there's lots of internet scams too to sell conversions and to do all kinds of things. So, so uh, the state of Israel is quite tight on its definition of what's a recognized com uh, community and Masoti communities are recognized communities. The practicalities of how that works is when you go to make Aliyah uh, together with your Aliyah papers, if you've converted, you'll put in a copy of your conversion certificate and uh, give the details of the conversion, that will go to the Aliyah department in Israel. And if the conversion was a Masorti conversion, it would go to the representative of the Masorti movement in Israel, who has to confirm, confirm whether the Masorti movement owns that conversion or not. What that means for the European Masorti Beit Din is that uh, the vast majority of our conversions will just sail through and there won't be any questions whatsoever and people make Aliyah and, and, and every year there are half a dozen people 
uh, who are converts who immigrate to Israel and they have no problems whatsoever. What people don't know is it's much more difficult to make to immigrate to Israel with an Orthodox conversion than it is with a uh, Masorti or Reform conversion. The reason for that is that it's exactly the same process. So if you've converted in an Orthodox Beit Din, it will go to the Aliyah department, who will give it to the chief rabbinate in Israel. But the chief rabbinate in Israel doesn't recognize every Orthodox rabbi as being Orthodox enough. So the London Beit Din doesn't have a problem with that. It's considered proper Orthodox, but any tendency of a liberal Orthodox conversion uh, uh, has great problems in Israel. And that's why some Orthodox communities will use the Masorti Beit Din and not the Orthodox Beit Din because uh, it's easier for people to immigrate with our conversion papers than with their conversion papers. Very interesting uh, uh, in, in how that uh, actually plays out. The, other thing that I would say is that there are other criteria beyond where you've had your conversion. The state of Israel isn't interested in giving any rabbi in the world who has any kind of ordination in the world uh, the right to become its immigration department and to decide its immigration uh, uh, policy. So in addition to you need the right set of papers, the conversion program needed to, to have taken at least a year. And the people who have converted also need to continue to remain active in their community for a year after the, the conversion. And sometimes conversions fail because of those criteria and not so much the, the conversion itself. It's a bureaucracy. I, I don't think that it's pro or anti Masorti, but it's a bureaucracy and you have to meet the rules. and. Uh, in general, if someone wants to immigrate to Israel, I say, speak to me first and I'll tell you how to navigate this so that you don't accidentally create problems for yourself. Um, really interesting. I wasn't aware about that particular complexity within uh, within orthodoxy and attempting to, to make Aliyah there. Um, I want to ask, you know, we are, we are getting low on time. I have a couple of questions I want to group together about the beginning of the process, which I think are um, you know, more, more aimed at Angela, maybe even slightly myself, which, um, yeah, which are, you know, what happens if someone isn't totally sure when they start the process? And also, what are the ways in which we dissuade um, conversions? And I think that question is based, that latter question is based on this idea that we say no to someone three times and then after they keep coming back to us, um, that we take them through that conversion. And um, Angela, do you wanna take a first shot at that? I'll take, yes, I can, I can certainly say something about how, how it starts. I mean, I'm not, a, I'm, not, I'm not the rabbi gatekeeper, so I, I can't say anything about that. But I can, I can say something about uh, people who are, are not sure. I mean, why would you be sure? I mean, you know, it, this is a huge step. I often think that that that, that becoming Jewish is it, it, it is a covenantal relationship, and it is akin to being married, right? So it's not speed it's not speed dating. You have to you can think that I I think this is what I'm going to do. But one of the purposes of the 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 the, the period of of learning and the period of practice and the period of engagement is to get to know your partner better. And so it, it is often the case that that people are not a hundred percent uh, sure. So earlier I said it was very important that it's a commitment class, it's not drop in and drop out. And that is still the case. So um, it is, uh, so so what, what we've decided to do, and this is something really that was was since Rabbi Jeremy joined, and we, we are in complete agreement on, on, on this. Uh, when I say joined, I mean, came, came to be the rabbi at, at, at New London, um, is that if people think they probably are, um, then if they enter into it with a, a spirit of um, respect and, and, and commitment and awareness and self-awareness, then they can join that, that, that program um, and understanding the, the, na the nature of it, that it is not, you know, it is not simply uh, to, to you know, find a few more, learn a few more uh, facts. Um, I have something very similar to your three, your three things, which is, um, uh, belief, behavior, and belonging. And I think those are the, and the belonging thing is the most critical. Um, and it's the, but it's also the most, 
uh, demanding. And so we have a we have a process where uh, because the course is is modular that people can take one module and at the end of it they are asked, so you think this is for you uh, do you want to go on your second date really um and uh, and usually not always but usually in that early stage people are able to make a decision about whether they want to go forward sometimes people go much further before they realize that they're they they you know they've boarded the wrong train um but um i'm using the journey <laughs> image here but generally speaking people know after that first that first unit of of learning whether whether they are and that's why it's called lachaim you know it's not it's not called judaism blah 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 or becoming or something it is it, the idea it is about a life choice I think that's enough. For, for yeah, great. No, thank you. Um, I think I'll also speak a little bit to that question of dissuading and um, that sort of original um, piece of text and piece of tradition that we get this idea from about turning someone away three times. Um, the, the story of that ends with them in the mikveh immediately. Like it's a, it's a conversation that happens. Are you sure? And they go, yes. And you go, are you sure? Are you, are you sure? Yes. And then you end up taking them to the mikveh and telling them about the mitzvot while they're in the mikveh. And that's not quite the way that we do it. <laughs> but, uh, you know, it's a year and a half. You know, that's, a sl that's slightly longer than that, uh, than that you know, three piece conversation. Um, and my sense of it is that people don't spend a year and a half going through that kind of journey and get to the end of it and want to go to a Beit Din without having to had to fight for it. In that sense that, you know, they have to make it work around their home life and they have to be engaging. And it's a, it's a lot of time and it's a lot of effort and it's a lot of spiritual and emotional energy. You know, I don't think that what they need on top of that is me saying, I don't really like you very much. And um, I think that is, you know, plenty of time for if they're not, if they're not sure. I also, you know, there was a question that I don't think we'll be able to get to very deeply because I want to just sort of ask one last before we get here, which was about, um, you know, anti-Semitism and how that's sort of uh, being handled right now. You know, um, people who start on this course, you know, I remember my first day at rabbinical school that um, people that the teachers said from here on out, from today onwards, people are going to treat you like a rabbi and you're not a rabbi yet. You've got five years until you become a rabbi, but people are going to ask you questions and they're going to they're going to turn to you and they're going to treat you as if you're a rabbi. So you better be ready. And if you're not, you know, you're not going to last this five or six years. I feel similarly about going through this course. You start on day one and actually the majority of the world is treating you like a Jew. You know, you've already thrown your lot in if you're spending your time going to synagogue and reading this stuff and praying like a Jew. You might not be a Jew yet, but you're actually, you know, you've sort of thrown your lot in already. And um, so I think, you know, I think that's how that piece plays out in my mind. I want to ask one last question um, before we go, because I think it's a very interesting one, um, uh, which I think actually sort of applies to both of you. It was a question to, to Rabbi Chaim, but I think that we sort of see it along the process well at the end, which is like, how do we deal with this question of leniency and strictness? Like how, what, uh, you know, what goes through our minds when we try to figure out when someone's before us, whether we need to be more lenient with this person or more strict with them as we go through. Um, maybe we'll start this one with, uh, with Rabbi Chaim and um, then Angela, if you want to add anything. It's not easy to, to, <laughs> to answer that question, but I think that you have to think of what your criteria are. And for me, the criteria is that uh, uh, it needs to be a process that has integrity. So if someone comes afterwards and says to me, why did you convert that person? I'll be able to answer that question. And ultimately, I'm a religious person. There's someday I'm going to stand in judgment before my maker on the decisions that I've made. And uh, the <clears throat> I, I, I said, I, I suppose the real question I ask myself is, you know, what's a successful conversion? A successful conversion isn't how the person performed in front of the Beit Din, but a successful conversion is where they're going to be in five years' time mm -hmm. and where they're going to be in 10 years' time. And uh, it's kind of my, my, my job isn't to make people's life difficult, and my job isn't to. Uh, uh, 
put needless restrictions on, on, on people, but, but, but ultimately I need to answer, do I think that this person knows enough, is involved enough, uh, is sincere enough that, that, that five and 10 years from now, they're still gonna be involved in their Jewish life and they're gonna consider that being part of their identity. That, that's kind of the, the, now I have a specific case in front of me, when I look at a specific case in front of me, then, you know, the, the circumstances might uh, indicate one thing rather than another. I talked about a case where I was over lenient and spent three years in court in Israel, but, but that person had spent five years teaching themselves Judaism before they registered into the program. And as a result of that, had a very short conversion program, not because I was showing them a favor, but because actually they entered the program knowing more than they would know at the end of the program. And I thought it was appropriate to, to grant them a short program and I would have done them a much bigger favor if I would say, said wait nine months and I'll do the the, the conversion nine months from now but, but uh, you know when, when I'm lenient it's not because I want to be nice or it's not because uh, the, the, the reason I'm lenient is that I think that it's justified to be lenient and when I'm strict it's not because I'm a mean person it's because I think that the circumstances justify that I need to be strict. Yofi, um, thank you, Rabbi Chaim. Angela, do you want to um, add anything there? I'll be very, very, yes, I'll be very quick. I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm aware of the, 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 the time, and of course, I'm not in this position at, at, at all, but I'm, I am sometimes involved in people's uh, deliberation about their, li their life chances, uh, sorry, their life choices, and, uh, or their lifestyle choices. And I, um, I simply say, first of all, I learned from a wise and wonderful person, never answer the question, always answer the questioner. So every, <laughs> every question that comes, it, it depends on who's asking it. And therefore that, um, but essentially I say, you go up in Madrigot, you don't go down in Madrigot. You, you know, so take a baby step. Don't take a big step that you might regret or be unable to fulfill so it's not quite the same as leniency and, and, and it's not about but but it is about take a little step you know do this on your shabbat this week next week do another more thing uh, don't do too much because because go you will you will it will be very damaging to you to have to to let go of it um, absolutely thank you i just want to add sort of one more thought to that question which is you know part of what I'm learning to look for, and I'm very much learning, I've only been doing this for a couple of years, is sort of the Jewish authenticity in the decision that's being made. That someone who's saying to me that they're having a hard time switching their phone off on Shabbat because they're because of a relationship with their mother and their mother not being well is, you know, not just me being nice by me being a bit more lenient with that person. It's also a recognition that there is a Jewish value that's playing out there. That um, I'm looking, you know, looking for people making decisions within that kind of context to me, I think makes a, is making a big difference as we, as we go through this. Um, Thank you, Angela. Thank you, Rabbi Chaim. It's been uh, hugely interesting and lovely to be able to sit with the two of you um, and to everyone for adding, um, adding questions as we've gone through. I hope that this has been as illuminating for you as it's been for me and as fun for you as it's been for me. And um, yeah, wonderful. Thank you so much for, for being here. It's a Thank you very much. It's been a real pleasure in being with you and uh, bye. <laughs> Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you, Angela. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you. Um, I'll just add as we are, um, before we make our way out about what it is that we'll be um, looking at in this space next week. Um, we will be going to gallery view to see you. Um, we'll be, next week we'll be with Stav Meisha, who is our uh, circus extraordinaire um, and also very well loved by this shul. Um, she's going to be presenting some research that she's done on Nazi representation in musical theater. Um, I think it's going to be hugely, hugely interesting. That will be um, next week in this slot. It is a ticketed event, so do keep an eye on the details. They come out on Facebook and through email. And I uh, look forward to, to seeing you there. Um, once again, thank you, Angela, and thank you, Rabbi Chaim, for being here.
All right. Good night, everyone.